morning and welcome to the Rust Belt Apartment Podcast presented by the Cooper Multifamily Team, where we focus on all things apartments with a keen eye on the Midwest's Rust Belt region. I'm your moderator, Peter Graylis, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Anthony DeMarco, and our newest team member, Tony Ranella. Unfortunately, Gary Cooper can't join us today, uh, but Augustino, no worries, he has put together some questions for you. Um, I'm pleased to introduce today's guest, Augustino Pintus, a real estate investor, developer, coach, and host of the wildly successful Bulletproof Cashflow podcast. Augustino is based in Cleveland and is the founder and principal of Realty Dynamics Equity Partners. He's one of the most active folks in our market, and it's a pleasure having him on the show. Augustino, welcome to the podcast. Hey, man, I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for, uh, for inviting me. Appreciate it. Glad you could make the time. Um, we got a lot to talk about today. I really want to focus on the here and the now because you're doing a ton of deals, a ton of, you're just a busy guy. And a yeah. lot of it, a lot of it is with a keen eye in the future and, and right now. But um, for some of our listeners that, that may not know you, um, which I'm sure a few, um, quick little dive into your background. Sure, so sure, I know sure. you're, you're, you, you don't come from a real estate family. Um, you know, you've, You've made a huge impact here in Cleveland in Northeastern Ohio, but uh, where did where does Augustino Pinches come from? Uh, let's get the quick uh, down and dirty on you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, and good to see you, Anthony and Tony. Good to meet you as well. So, um, Likewise. yeah, my but my background has primarily been uh, I grew up in Canada, right? Grew up to uh, to Italian immigrants, and uh, you know I, I've I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. Like since I was a kid, I wanted to have my I wanted to do my own thing. And I was basically encouraged, so to speak, by my parents to skip the entrepreneur route and go work in corporate. So I ended up spending a lot of time. Uh, I, had a, I guess I had, a, I had a bent for technology. I used to love tech, right? And that was my thing. And um, the, the, the thing I often like to say is the worst thing to do in life is to get good at the wrong thing. And I got mm. good at the wrong thing. It was technology. Technology was what I thought I wanted to be at, uh, only to realize, you know what? Uh, I, I think I'm a better knack for real estate. So uh, I'd say about, I don't know, 17, 18 years ago, I started doing single family homes and small multifamily. Um, but it wasn't until more recently, I'd say about five years ago, when I was, uh, I was basically in the world at the sea level, right? At okay. the sea level executive, you're, you're, you're oftentimes, especially when you're working IT, maybe the last two, three years tops, then you're mm. out the door, right? Mm. And I've been through that cycle numerous times. And I'm like, you know what? I, I think I'm just going to do something on my own now and, and, and really scratch an entrepreneurial bug, so to speak. You know, it's uh, uh, something I, should, I probably should have done a lot earlier on, but I didn't. But sure. hey, you know what? Better late than never. So mm. about five years ago, I decided to really commit to go all in on real estate. Because despite some of the things that had happened in my past, um, though that single family portfolio, the small multifamily portfolio I built 17 years prior was always performing. It was always there for me, you know, okay. and I saw that and it was one of those things that, you know what, if I just commit to that, then I can really build the life that I want. Right. And that's, that's what it really came down to, you know, it's, uh, really understanding, uh, and getting into the, the single family business. Uh, it's, it really exposed the true power of real estate, um, at least at, at a very small level. Right. So, well, yeah, in, but, in, in Augustino, you know, I, I have a little bit of a peek behind the curtains, uh, so to speak, because I know, uh, your background and obviously, you know, we, we have the relationship together. Um, however, you know, obviously our listeners, you know, talk about maybe, in, when, when you transitioned from IT to real estate, you know, I know that you were in a ton of different locations, right? And, and you know, you just weren't in Detroit um, or in Windsor, right? So, you know, talk about your experience in living in certain, in all of these different locations when, when you kind of in, in the 10 year span, right? Yeah. Um, and, and what made you land uh, here in Cleveland? Uh, w when you were ready to make that full go effort into uh, into real estate, multifamily, and, and obviously single family as well. You know, Anthony, I can tell you that it took a high level of commitment 
you know, I quit being a spectator in my life and became an active participant. And that means then really, and this is where it gets a little, a little kooky, a little spiritual, if you will, right? You have to sort of separate yourself from what's going on around you right now and deciding, is this really how I want to live or am I going to change that? And, you know, I had one of those, those epiphanies, so to speak. It's like, really, am I going to continue doing the, the corporate thing or am I going to fulfill what I, what I believe to be what I'm really good at? That, that is entrepreneurship. And I'm not knocking the 40 hour work week. I'm not saying anything bad about sure. it at all. Sure. You know, corporate America is fine. Uh, it, it, but there's certain, there's certain folks out there that might be listening right now. And maybe they're entrepreneurs themselves, but you know, they're scared to take that leap. And I didn't want to live my life wondering, you know, at, at 80 years old, should I have left corporate and done something on my own at least try you know i don't want to live that way man you know that's mm. what it is mm. and but part of it is, is again becoming an active participant in your life living living to your true potential and i felt that at that time when i made that decision i wasn't living to my true potential i just wasn't you know um and and, and listen as a c-level executive in in corporate hey you're making you know you're making 300 400 dollars a year it's, it's not bad. It's not bad. You know, it's okay. Um, but, you know, is that all I got? That's really what it comes down to. And, and uh, I, I felt I could do more. And uh, so I, I went all in on me. And, um, you know, hey, it's always it's always tough starting out. That's that's the hard part, you know, because mm -hmm. there's and I think that's that's one of the things as, as human beings, as, as as our species, we we love predictability. Right, we love predictability. Uh, that's why a stock. If, if if someone, even if if even on the stock market, if if if, uh, if Amazon projects a loss in the next quarter, it's kind of like we'll take a huge hit because if they announce it ahead of time, because people have already expected it. Right, it's already built into the price, so to speak, uh, as opposed to just surprising Wall Street with a loss. Uh, same same thing goes with with getting up and knowing that you're going to be going to work on Monday, right? Uh, or, or, or knowing that you're going to work until five o'clock and then you're going to be off work, then you're going to do X, Y, Z. People love that having that predictability. As an entrepreneur, you have less predictability. <laughs> you know, I mean, at least I do anyway. So oh, sure. uh, you know, it's uh, and, and part of it is is that can you can you cut it? You know, as an entrepreneur, and I would say that any any one of these successful entrepreneurs we have uh, running around here uh, here in Cleveland or elsewhere for that matter, there is a level of of um, I guess you could say unpredictability, right? Sure. And uh, but it's also exciting too. I find it exciting, right? Yeah, that's so, the exciting part of it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, so, so why Cleveland, though, Augustino? Why? What, what made you land here in Cleveland? Uh, so you know, when at the very last company that I worked at, um, I, I made the decision to leave that company and get out, and I decided, you know what? I'm going to go on real you? estate. I, I was, I, I was actually, uh, yeah, I was actually in Indianapolis and, okay. uh, and I started liquidating a lot of these single families that I had. I knew I was going to do something in real estate. I didn't know what exactly I was going to do. Right. Because uh, as, 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 as you know, there's so many different things you can do in real estate. It's not just one thing. It's not just multifamily. Multifamily is not the only asset class out there. You know, there's, there's commercial, there's hotel, there's, there's self-storage, there's development, there's all Oh, completely, of completely. Yeah. And, that, and that's something I'd like to touch on towards the end of the, yeah. the pod is, is, is diversification. But yeah, uh, but I'll tell you that um, when I made that decision to really shift my life from really being a technologist to being, to getting into real estate, I started looking at different markets. And I was, I was, at, I was in Virginia at that time, Virginia Beach. And um, because as I said, I was liquidating a bunch of stuff. And at that point I'd had a bunch of properties in different places. Uh, Virginia Beach is one of them. And I found that Cleveland was one of these places that had not fully recovered from the 2008 crash. You know, hmm. um, I, I wasn't completely educated like I am today on you know, migration and growth and things like that. But I did see that from a pricing perspective, it's still fairly depressed back then anyway, uh, I did see that, the, that jobs were on the upswing. Uh, I did see, this is where I, 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 I started to understand the difference between cash flow markets and appreciation markets, two very different types of markets that, yes. that as, as an investor, you need to understand what these two, these two uh, uh, types of markets are. Because without understanding this, you could be overpaying for an asset thinking it's going to go up forever and it's not. 
um, or it's going to have uh, these 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 huge jumps that don't necessarily happen on in cash flow markets. So um, I started understanding that too. You know, I started really committing myself to to understanding how to even how to even understand the market because I, I didn't really know that much about it. You know, I, I had to really learn it. So sure. I picked I picked Cleveland. I took a, a temporary role at a at a company in, in Akron and really started to dig in and getting to know the market. You know, and that's that's the thing. It's um, understanding it's more than just like I actually committed to moving to a place I loaded up everything I owned in my car and drove to <laughs> drove to Cleveland right or, yeah. or Akron really yeah. and uh I mean and, and people aren't willing to do that you know the people today are not willing to do that you know and, and that's the thing I went all in and uh I decided that I I had to uh, I had to uh put myself in that situation and that was the best way to do it you know that was the best way to do it and, and maybe Augustino talk about some of the fundamentals of having, you know, the, the boots on the ground presence in a new market while you're trying to learn everything as well. Sure, and, sure, sure. And how did you, how did you go about uh, scaling in that sure. market? It, it's, and that's the thing, you know, Anthony, um, and you know, hey, we talk almost every day. So you kind of, you, you kind of know the backstory, right? But it's like, I would say then that um, being present in that market gives you some huge advantages it's not and you know what the funny thing is it's not so much the uh the relationships you build with the brokers and all that which is important by the way you know building the relationships with the brokers making sure that uh, you, you get a feel for what's going on uh it's it's real it's also understanding the culture the culture matters the culture mm -hmm. of a city matters right and every city hell every, every every locality every neighborhood has a culture and you really have to understand what that is and so the distinct advantage that i have being here anyway is that i understand these things at a, at a micro level right i live it every day sure you know, i'm here i'm here every day i get to see it you know i get to see the cranes in the air in uh, right next door to me here at Sharon Williams, you know, I get to see that. Or when you're going over the bridge, you see other cranes on the other side of the bridge over there. You see, you visualize it, you become part of that community too. And um, part of it is also making a difference in that community as well by by buying these assets, making them better, and, and really improving the lives of these of these, these folks that live there. I, I would say that um, if, like, if, as you guys know, we're looking at other other areas to buy. I certainly feel that in order to do it effectively, I have to be there to do it. I have to be there. Like, you know, I don't mean just read a bunch of articles because that's how many, many folks make a decision as to when, where they're gonna invest, which is fine to start off. But I think you also, I think another critical aspect is making yourself, uh, putting yourself in that area, which mm -hmm. again, requires requires some commitment, you know? Um, and then- you know yeah. I think I think a big part of your success is is not only being here in in the market you're focused on Cleveland Akron, um, but also building a brand alongside it. Um, yeah. So I'd like to to quickly go there as well. Right behind you, you've got uh, Bulletproof Cash Flow. So uh, you know you're in the hundred multiple hundreds of episodes on your podcast. Yeah. Um, you know that's that's part of your branding, but you're also building a team building a team of operations folks around you. Um, maybe just a quick foray into, you know, how, you know, how that's come, how that's coming along um, uh, and, and how that feeds into your business. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, um, I discovered early on that this whole concept of, of, uh, of investing and of, of, of building building a real estate company was uh, was important to me, you know, thankfully, right? And what I wanted to do is build a life, and actually, like I said earlier, not become a spectator, but to become a participant. But I wanted to build a life in which uh, I have I have all these businesses that are in that are that are in the life. Right? So meaning that it's not, it's not one of this you know a uh, uh, work life balance, but me, more like. Uh, it's the, the, the business is integrated. It's an integrated life, right? So that's first and foremost, right? Um, then it was, okay, what, what are we going to stand for? What is our message, right? And the thing is, is that I, 
I, I wanted to build something that demonstrated just like just like the this this name is more than just a name, right? It's it's mm. how we it's how we do. It's what we do. It's bulletproof cash flow. I don't do high risk deals. I don't do uh, I, you know I don't do crypto. I don't do uh, NFTs. I don't do any of that stuff. Is is because you know is because I hate it or anything else like that. It's because I want certainty. You know I want certainty. I want to know that. Uh, if I'm going to put if I'm going to put something into an asset, the, the asset will perform. That's important to me, and that's important to the investors that we serve, right? And um, part of it too to do that is to understand the various markets you operate in. I understand this market. This is a cash flow market. What does that mean exactly? That means then that when you buy an asset, you have a good expectation of good, regular, steady cash flow over time. Uh, you might have some appreciation. And uh, if there's a wild swing in appreciation, that's fine, right? It's not expected. In my underwriting, I don't even underwrite like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's an increase. And then, you know what? If there is a slowdown, or not if, when there is a slowdown. <laughs> Precisely. Um, yeah, when there's a slowdown, typically in a cash flow market like this, you're not going to see a massive cut in half on a cost per door. You just don't see that. It's just not, it doesn't usually happen, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, because you know, when you say like this, you're you're talking here in Northeast Ohio. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. In in in, in general, like even many of these Midwestern states, these, it, wherever you have a cash flow market, right? Uh, what I define to be a cash flow market. Um, so you're not going to see these rapid jumps or, or downwards, right? As opposed to a place like Miami or New York or Los Angeles, where you have these fast run ups. And it's and there's not enough cash flow to support that run up, and then all of a sudden the bottom falls out. So it, it, you have this jump from 100 grand a door to 200 grand a door with you know on 1500 dollars rents, and then all of a yeah. sudden, yeah. <laughs> then all of a sudden it drops back down to 100. It's like, like a correction, right? Sure. It's like that that you know, and there's guys that do very very well with with those types of, of deals, right? Um, fine and dandy. You all have fun with that. It's not what I do. It's just not what I do. You know, I, I, I like to deal with, with real deals, like deals that, I, that have cash flow that supports what's going on with that, with that, um, with that asset. It's very, very, it, you know. it, may, it may be Augustino. It's a nice segue into, you know, you're, you're, you're talking, you're bringing up your investors, you're bringing up, obviously, you know, finding a cash flow market. Um, you know, obviously you saw Northeastern or Northeast Ohio as an opportunity uh, and you put yourself here, right? Obviously, when I met you uh, at that time, you were forming a partnership with uh, with Kenny Wolf in in, in uh, down in Dallas, Texas, who had has a presence down there and didn't necessarily have a presence uh, here in northeast or, or northeast Ohio. Um, maybe talk a little bit about uh, syndication, uh, some of your some of the crowdfunding, some of the syndications that you guys uh, started to do here in in, in Ohio. Um, especially surrounded around, you know, obviously cash flow and, and how you guys were pitching some of the investors on some of these deals. Sure, sure, sure. Well, you know, I, I'd say that uh, first off, nobody has ever existed on this planet that has done something hugely successful all by themselves. That has never happened. It's, it's always happened through some sort of partnership, through some sort of conglomeration of folks that, that really had a common goal. And I also understood this early on too, you know, uh, when I was really starting to learn syndication outside of just doing single family, you know, it's like single family is fine. It's dandy. You can usually, if you have enough money coming in, like I did as, as a C-level executive, you can do all that stuff yourself. Mm. It's fine. You know, and it's okay. I'm not knocking it. It's fine. Um, if you're going to do bigger deals, very hard to do by yourself, especially when you're starting out. Right. Uh, I guess once once you get much larger and you have the cash flow coming in and you have the net worth and, and you have the liquidity, you know, then you could probably get any bank to back you up. Um, but in, in the case of uh, in the case of you know, developing partnerships, it, it, that was something I realized early on. You know, I realized that early on I, um, I needed to start establishing establishing partnerships. But more importantly, what, but what does that mean exactly? You know, and that's that's one of the key questions here. Delivering value, offering value to someone else and fulfilling a need that they have that they can't do with by, their, by, their, by themselves, right? And 
this is important. This is worth mentioning a second time. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing value to a relationship. And it's funny, you know what? It's, it's funny because, you know, if you have a, a spouse, uh, you know, you're, you're bringing something to that relationship, right? And the reason why- Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, because, well, it, it, and if you don't, a spouse will bounce. They right. leave, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And it, it generally works with friendships. It works with friendships too, right? If you have a sure. buddy and you're, if your buddy comes around and every time they come around, they're asking you for money, they're toxic. They, they're, they're, they're idiots or, and they, they embarrass you because every time you go out, they go get wasted and start, you know, causing trouble. Take, take, take. Yeah, exactly. And, and unfortunately that's, that's where many, where many folks fall flat is that they, they get into this mode of, I, I you know, I'm, I'm here, uh, do something for me. It's like, mm. why would anybody do that? You know? Um, and I was never like that. Fortunately, uh, I, I did see a need of like, try to fulfill, try to, try to solve a problem for someone else. And no matter how much money they have, every single person on this planet has a problem. If you can help them solve that problem, then they'll be, uh, th- then, then you get in their good graces and maybe they'll help you, right? It's, sure. it's, it's, it's understanding, it's also understanding human psychology, right? Uh, I, I help people all the time. I don't ask for anything. I don't, I don't, I don't, well, you owe me here. I'll send you a bill. You know, I don't even, I don't even say I'll send you a bill as a joke. I don't even joke about that stuff. Right. <laughs> I don't want them thinking that I'm like, I'm going to keep track of this stuff. Right. And um, so with my partnerships, all the partnerships that I've ever engaged with, it was like, how can I help this person become more successful? Cause I know that if I can help them become more successful, then I'll become successful too. It's, it's, it, you know, and the funny thing is it's very easy but it's more than just saying it. It's doing it once, doing it twice, following up, and then doing it again. And most people like, you know, and there's been times when, you know, someone, someone offered to, you know, underwrite deals for me. They'll, they'll do it entirely for free. I'm like, okay, sure. Here's the deal. Underwrite it. You send it over. They never see them again. It's like, <laughs> you, so it's like, how serious were they? You know, how serious were they? Right. And, most most guys like me don't want to waste time with folks like that. Well, it sounds like it sounds like yeah. you found a, a perfect partner in Kenny Wolf. Yeah, uh, you two complement each other extremely well, um, both inside and outside of deals. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Ken, Kenny's a Kenny's a great dude. He's uh, wildly successful in in, uh, in his markets, and he's he you know I think at that time he really wanted to. He didn't even know about Cleveland really until I brought it up to him. And, uh, and then we started just working on deals together. We, started, we did one high rise. And then, then I think after the high rise, we did. Um, we did well, you did, of, you did a couple of the deals with, with our team yeah. uh, right off the bat with Kenny. Maybe we let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Right. Because, um, you know, you brought Kenny, who's the, you know, a guy from, from Dallas, Texas, who, who you just said, doesn't really know much about Cleveland. Um, and, and you brought him into deals in uh, a, right at, right on the west side of Cleveland, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you, you put him right into the heart of Cleveland, uh, and you guys found some immediate success in you know that 1970s workforce housing kind of bread and butter product here. So maybe talk about um, your experience into getting into the deals, obviously working with us, closing, um, and, and what's going on with them right now, and how you've turned a lot of them around through some of your rebrands well certainly working with us that's a big part of the of the response <laughs> is, uh you know what our team did for you augustino um, well you know but, but you know what though i mean joking aside no it's, it's absolutely true you know it's um you know I, I could never have figured it out by myself obviously you know i would never have got the deals if uh if it wasn't as close to you guys as we are right that's a big that is a big part of it and um it, well, the fantastic not, the fantastic thing about you, Augustino, quickly, if I may interrupt, yeah. is you participate in fully marketed broker deals. Um, you see a value in fully marketed broker deals, um, but you're also gung ho about off market. Um, yes. And I think you found success on both sides of that spectrum. And as brokers, as a team, we, we love both, right? We've represented you on both ends of that spectrum as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is, is that, you know, there, when it comes to like these off market everybody's got you know everybody's all crazy about off market it, it off market is not always as crap what's cracked up to be 
All right, that's a thing. Okay, just because something's off market, okay, it means you have you have no competitors. Okay, super. That's good. That's good news, right? Um, so but is that truly the case, Augustine? No, no. But that's what I'm saying. Who's that's where he's buyer? going. That's where he's is going. That yeah. Who's, the who's case? The next, right. But who's I, I'm the next buyer? I'm not doing any of that. <laughs> right. <I'm saying> that's <laughs> really. Well, that's but that's the thing though too, right? Because I've, I've I have participated in both, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like who's who's going to be the next buyer for that asset? And the cool thing about it is that if there is something that's marketed and it's got that many eyes on it, and it, and it, it, and the price is getting bid up. Um, that means that there's there's other folks out there that are also interested in that deal. That's good. That's good. Sure. If nobody was interested in that deal and it's marketed, if nobody was interested in that deal and you're the only one bidding on it, you got a problem. Yeah. That means it's a, it's a crappy deal. Someone has seen something and found something or a group of people have found something that's a terrible deal and you should stay away from it, right? If you're the only one bidding on it. Uh, these days, it's kind of hard to come by, like you know, I'm, I'm like a you know, hundred plus deep unit deal where nobody's bidding, unless it's in, sure. you know, unless it's in an area that's somewhat undesirable. Uh, but for the most part, it's like um, if, if there's nobody chasing down that deal, and you're the only one. It's probably not a good deal, <laughs> more than likely. Well, and, and, and you know, and you know, August, you know, and we'll get into this, you know, here here later uh, in the episode um, where we're going to talk about, you know, obviously the importance of being a closer, and I think that that's why you're able to participate in marketed and, you know, not not so marketed deals, if you will. Um, yeah. But let's dial this back for a second. Let's talk about you guys getting into workforce housing product, right? Let's talk about the deals that you guys bought, uh, what they look like when you bought it, what you and Kenny did, and what where you're, you you were take the deals, right? Because I think that that's a good story, right? Because again, you have investors, and unless I'm wrong, most of your investors are not necessarily local here to Cleveland, right? So right, why are they right. giving you money to invest in in Cleveland and? Part of that is because of you guys' success, right? And, and so let's talk about that. Um, and, and I think, in, in, in not to, to answer the question for you here um, or speak too much here, because I want to hear from you, but I think Hedgewood, um, Hedgewood Manor is a, uh, it was a great example of an opportunity that you guys saw where you guys were able to rebrand and and you tell me if you guys were able to exit the way that you guys had projected up front yes yes no you know um we bought a lot of c-class properties early on and, and you know c-class as defined as like you said earlier that uh you know 50s 60s 70s product workforce housing um you know it, it's uh and, and that hedgewood deal on on the um on the west side about 148 units, I think it was, right? Yep. Yep. And uh, you know, it, it was a fine asset just going in. Uh, I think it had been called Hedgewood for a very long time. I think maybe even since the beginning, I believe, since they built it back in the 60s or whatever. Potentially. And yeah, potentially. So so what we ended up doing though was going in and really understanding the community, right? Because like I said before, every city has a culture. Every neighbor has a culture. Guess what? Every apartment community has a culture too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And understanding what that culture is and, and, um, and building, not just building apartments, but building a community is very, very important to, uh, to reducing your turnover and uh, increasing the satisfaction of the folks that live there, right? So we went ahead and we did a re, not only did we do a rebrand on Hedgewood, we called it Las Colinas, uh, but we also spent a lot of money, uh, you know, of course, just repairing things like asphalt and, and, and sewer lines and things like that, which are very important, but also painting it, painting the asset, make it look really bright and make, make it pop, you know, uh, make it stand out. It's not cheap to paint 10 buildings. All right? It wasn't cheap then. And it's not, certainly not cheap now. And we still do the same sort of a model here. Uh, but um, the, the rebrand was very, very important to letting letting the people that live there know that you know there's there's uh there's there's some changes some positive changes that are coming you know some mm. positive changes and and the, you know so of course inevitably you know part of the game here with any of these assets that we, we acquire 
is we buy them, we make them better, we crack it, crank up the rents. That's the model, right? It's like this value add by default, by definition, is what it means. Sure. Um, then what do we do? We, then we go and, and we go do the refi, pull out the equity, deliver the equity back to the investors, and we'll wash rinse repeat. Very very simple simple model. That's what that's what's also beautiful about real estate, right? Um, in the in the case of Hedgewood, though, um, just doing so far, Anthony, we're up to the point where we've done the rebrand, we've done the painting, we, where uh, the asset is performing just fine. Uh, I don't think we're in, we have a a um, uh, a refi planned. I don't think we're going to do it this year. Uh, I would love to do it this year. We have some. Uh, it's a, the way that we we put the debt together. There's some prepayment stuff that we want to clear gotcha. first before before gotcha. we do anything like that. Uh, but I mean, listen, you guys know as well as I do, uh, the amount we paid for, we can easily. The cost per door is double of what it was before. Right yeah. now. Yep. You know, right now, it's ridiculous. Why? Because not only have we increased the rents, we've also seen cap rate compression take hold as it's, as it's done throughout the whole nation. Sure. But the cap rate compression here in the Midwest is certainly lower, um, but it's still there. It's still present, you know. And uh, when you're able to, to acquire the asset at like an eight cap, <laughs> you know, it's pretty strong, right? It's pretty sure. strong. So sure. it's, 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 it's phenomenal. And we've, we've applied the same sort of strategy to, to Hedgewood, to the Bluestone Project, to Fulton. Uh, we've done other stuff as well. Uh, same, sort of, uh, same sort of model where we go in, we do the rebrand, we clean the place up, we let the, 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 the residents there know that um, we're, we're there to, to help them build uh, a better life for them, you know, at least in, as far as their home is concerned anyway, you know, so um, yeah, man, it's, uh, it, it, you know, that's just, and that's just one part of the business that we do, right? Uh, sure. We have other parts of the business as well, but uh, that's, that to me is, is very rewarding, you know, seeing that and, and, uh, and really making a difference in people's lives. It's great. Well, and, and, and I can, I can attest, you know, it, it is a night, you know, it's a night and day difference when you're driving into the property from, you know, where it was to what it is today. Um, they've done a fantastic job at rebranding and like, you know, like Augustino said, painting the buildings. Uh, you, you would be shocked at how much of a difference um, painting the buildings actually made yeah. was like you, you completely, you know, reskinned and refaced the, every single building. And like you said, I, I know that the tenants um, would appreciate it. We spend a lot of time at that community. So you had you had good tenants there as it was. So. Um, so can certainly see the, the the positivity that you guys are doing in these de in these communities, and part of that now is going to be a, the next segue into all right. Well, you, you've talked about a ton of deals. You guys are over a thousand units now in workforce housing here in Cleveland, right? Um, people are continuing to give you their money, so obviously you guys have seen successes. Um, you know, it, 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 in something you said is you have a very simple model. So can anybody do it? Is it easy? Uh, is it easy buying and managing and owning buildings in Cleveland, or is there something that is important? And is that third-party management or just management in general? Um, and and maybe let's talk about some of that because I think that that's an important um, decision when you're buying, especially yeah. in a market like this. And you guys have gone through, uh, you know, a few turbulences, if you will, through your times and you guys uh, are in a good place now. So t talk about the operations behind it all and, uh, and, and is it so easy and can anybody do it? You know, um, many people underestimate the, the, um, the, 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 the class of the asset. You know, it's funny, there's, uh, it's going to sound terrible, but you can always tell a newbie when the first thing they mention is a cap rate. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a cap rate is irrelevant at first. Cap rate is an indicator of risk is what it is, right? If someone says, if they're starting off the conversation with, oh, my God, look, it's a 10 cap. That immediately tells me you better run, man. That's what it means. You, you better, better, better get armed and better put on a, better put on a bulletproof vest because, uh, uh, cash flow is not going to save you in that case. It's going to be <laughs> sure. why? Because because cap rate is is an indicator of risk. The higher the cap rate, the greater the risk. 
the lower the cap rate, the lower the risk. So what do you want, right? And the thing is, is that when you're getting into these C-class assets, these workforce housing assets, uh, you know, yes, like I said earlier, we went in, we, try, we, want, we want to do right by everybody that lives there, right? We want to do right by creating a, 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 as great a, a, a community as we possibly can. But at the same time too, you know, this, this, this is workforce housing. It's what it is. It is what it is. And I'm not slamming down workforce housing. We own plenty of assets. It, it is management intensive and the management team must be able to navigate the waters when it comes to managing an asset. Uh, I will admit that, um, you know, th th there's, there's a pump. Huh. There's a lot of bad managers out there. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that uh, anybody who's, who's done this for any length of time will tell you that uh, a, lot of, a lot more bad management companies than there are good ones. <laughs> well, I think it's, the, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an, across any industry, you're yeah, going to have the 80-20 yeah. rule, right? 20% yeah. of the people are killing it, 80%, they're not. But man, uh, I'll tell you, it's like there's a lot, a lot of bad management sure. companies. But, you've, but you've found some good ones. Yes. Yes, yeah. we did. We did. We did. And, and, and how important and how important is it to have a good one? Oh, it's it's not just important. It's absolutely key. You know, that's lifeline. It's a, it's a, it, yeah. Because here's the thing. You know, all, all these gurus on Facebook, all they talk about is hurry up, buy a deal. Hurry up, buy a deal. Hurry up, buy a deal. That's easy compared to running this asset successfully for the next ten years. That's hard work, man. Yeah, it's there. tremendously <laughs> hard work. You know, it's it's not easy. And because the folks that are on the front lines that are serving the people it, it, that, that are living at these locations, it's tough to do. It's yep. it, there's a customer service element to it, yes. But then you also have payment processing to handle. You have uh, the, the 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 maintenance guys to, to to repair and keep the place up. You know, you have to do you have to do data analytics to compare how is my asset versus the other guy ass, uh, assets up the street. You know, how 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 does it compare price wise, cost mm -hmm. uh, cost per square foot, uh, rent per square foot rather? Uh, what amenities do they have versus we do? You know, things like that. You have to do that mm -hmm. stuff like all the time, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, the market changes all the time. And these are the types of things that if your property management group, if they suck, they're not doing stuff like that. Sure. And that's a kiss of death. And that's that to me is one of the most critical components. Buying the asset is easy compared mm -hmm. to running it successfully. I love that's that. Hard. I that's love hard. that. It's a great point. Buy, buying yeah. the asset is easy. Well, maybe that's why, and look, that's why Augustino's a closer, Peter. Yeah. That's what we said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, again, another reason. Uh, we enjoy working with you, Augustino, is you are uh, a closer. Yep. Your contractual integrity is second to none. And um, when you set out to take down a deal, God forbid, you almost always do. I can't think of an instance where you didn't. No, 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 not, not, all, um, not almost. I've, 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 we have 100% success rate. I, I knew I misstepped there. <laughs> I'm waiting for so, Always. Always yeah. closes. Yes, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, there's there's these guys that again, the gurus. I, 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 that's the second time I'm slamming the gurus, but um, they're like uh, at one point. I, I, don't, I don't hear too much about this anymore. But at one point, they were like, send out L LOIs to every single deal you could find, and and just hurry up and do that, and maybe you'll get a response. And it's like you know, sending out LOIs to everybody is like telling every single girl you meet that you love her. Eventually, you know, we'll believe you, you know? yes. Oh, that is good. And, and the thing is, though, is that the way that you guys know how we work, I'm only I want to put down an LOI. You better damn well believe that's as good as a PSA. I'm closing that that deal. That's what's going to happen, right? Uh, that's how I operate. 100%. I don't I don't intend on if I don't want that deal, I'm not going to send you an LOI. You know, and that's very very important to us. And um, you know, there. That's just that's just how we work. It's it's part of it's part of this whole bulletproof thing. It's more again, it's more than just cash flow, and it's more than just how we buy it. It's also about how we buy stuff. And um, listen, I, I've never retraded either. You guys know that I never retrade. I never we we, we don't uh, we always, and we always close. That that to me is uh, is is the is is one of the key aspects. Now, why is that? 
It's like what I said before about delivering value. What is important to a broker? What is important to a broker? And I'm going to talk for you guys for a second because I already know what's important. This is how, this is why we do what we do here, right? The broker does not want to be embarrassed when they present your offer. The broker wants to know they're, they're going to get paid, right? Those are the two yep. key aspects right there. The two key aspects that if the broker is going to present you to the, to a seller and, and it's like, and you don't perform, the seller looks at you and say, what the hell you guys screwed up. You guys looks at us, the, the brokers yeah, yep. as mm -hmm. the brokers, you mm -hmm. guys screwed up. You guys, you guys messed up. You guys brought me the wrong guy to buy this thing. You guys are idiots. That's the first thing that they say. Okay. It's, and it doesn't matter that, that, that buyer was, uh, was an idiot or it wasn't serious about doing the deal. It doesn't matter, right? The same way it doesn't matter as a buyer of the asset too. This is why I, and on my side, what I do is I, I am, I am ruthless. I am absolutely ruthless when it comes to putting deals together, right? Because I know I have, a, and you guys know these guys, the team that I have is a great team. They're a great group of people. They don't screw up. They better not screw up and they won't screw up, right? Because if our, our lender doesn't perform, say they can't, find a, they can't find a lender in time, you guys don't blame the lender, the broker. It's my fault. If sure. the attorney screws up, who, it's not the attorney's fault. It's my fault. If mm -hmm. the title company screws up, whose fault is that? Is it the title company? No, no, no. You guys point the finger at me. I'm the guy. I'm the one taking responsibility. So it's, it's absolutely critical that the team you put together uh, as a buyer too, they're solid. They're rock solid. They, they gotta be, right? And that's how I'm able to put down, like I know I'm gonna slam down, uh, slam down on a deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut it down because I know that my team is strong. And I also understand too, that what's important to the broker, what's important to the guys on the other side, besides price, besides that. Mm -hmm. right? It's not about mm -hmm. low ball deals. Look at me. I've got a great deal. Who cares? doesn't matter. Can you close it? You know, that's, that's what matters because everybody wants to get paid. <laughs> well, and I think that mindset right there that you spelled out is why you get awarded a lot of deals. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah I was going to say, that's probably what separates you from you know, most you know, players out there. That's why you become, became so successful as you are right now in this market. Yeah. It's strong. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's, it's, and that's a that's a very big deal. Never retrade for the love of God. Never retrade. That's another one too. Never mm -hmm. retrade. We don't retrade. You yeah. hear that uh, out there, buyers? That's, <laughs> that's possible right there. That is right. You know, and and, and something, Augustino, you didn't even say, but you, you you said it without saying it is communication, right? Because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, you're saying, hey, it's all it, from from one aspect, it's all our fault, right? And from other aspects, it's all your fault, right? So. You know, we, you got to be a team um, and you have one common goal, obviously, to get to the finish line. And so when you can communicate, you can be transparent like you have been in the past. I think that's why we've, we've been able to successfully um, get so many different deals to the finish line. And none of them have been easy. And I think that's, you know, again, the common theme is that nothing's easy, right? Um, but, but if you're all in it, all in to work together, obviously, um, you know, you can always make it happen and, and we always have. So, yes, yes, yes. You know, you know Anthony, of all, of all the deals that, that, that we've done and other deals have done without you guys too, every single one has been some of a pain in the ass. Yeah, and exactly. It's, it's, all, it's almost like it's the first time, uh, the first transaction has ever happened. <laughs> no, matter, <laughs> no matter what deal it is, it's like, this, yeah. this is like, oh my God, this is the first buy we've ever done before. It's like, what are you guys talking about? Did you guys do this yesterday? You know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of funny how that works too. And that's, that, that's, you know, that's also a very critical aspect too, in that um, you got to be easy, easy to work with, got to be easy to work with. And um, that's absolutely critical, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if you're difficult to work with, okay, fine. Let's say you do close that deal. If you made it a pain in the ass for everybody all the way through, Chances of you getting a deal ever again, eh, not so good. Sure. <laughs> not yep. so good, right? So, in, in, in Augustino, maybe this is a good time to talk about, because you're doing deals right now, and it's something that everybody that's listening to this can talk about is this environment that we're in is, uh, is not an easy environment, and it's pretty volatile. Um, yeah. So can you talk about how you guys are um, getting through some of the current transactions you guys have in process, 
how you guys are underwriting deals now that we have such a um, volatile market in terms of interest rates rising and, and dipping and rising and you know, lenders not necessarily even uh, able to quote rates right now when you're looking at deals? Uh, you know, hey, like, like every other market right now, um, there are certainly challenging times, right? There, it's almost like there's, there's a moving target, to your point, of with, with, with all these different rates change, changing. Lenders are, are not committing to lock in in rates now, um, which, uh, you know, it, it's very odd to see and you understand why. Sure. Uh, it's, um, it, it, it makes it certainly very, very difficult, right? It makes it very difficult uh, to, to get deals done. So um, I, I do find that for many folks out there that are now decided to sell, like they might've been told to sell eight months ago by you guys, you guys might've pitched them and they said, oh, no, 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 we're, we're waiting for the market to go up even further. You know, and here yeah. we are. Now it's like, no, nothing's going to move. Because what happens is when, when rates goes up, when rates go up, oh, like, it's funny. Most, most people I talk to, on the, on the, on the, especially on the title side, are still seeing transactions, but not nearly the same, um, same velocity like there was a couple of years ago. They're still taking place. And, but, you know, a couple of years ago, it was moving so fast and furious that now it's still fast. I don't know how fast it is, right? Sure. Uh, things are just, I, th I think it, naturally things are taking longer, just, you know, even just some of the aspects of the transaction, right? When you talk yeah. about third parties, appraisals, inspections, right? Um, but, you used to be but, able to get back in two weeks. Now, now you're getting quoted, you know, six four, weeks, six yeah. weeks, yeah. Five, six weeks, even then sometimes. So, um, but, but I yeah. would say, but, but Anthony, it's, it, but it's, but it's more than that, though. It's it's. Well, I was gonna say, how are you guys? Are you guys changing the way that you guys are underwriting deals right now? Yes. Um, knowing yeah. that, you know, hey, we don't have a committed rate lock that we can underwrite to. So, you know, can you talk at some of the fundamentals that you guys have tweaked so that you guys can still, because because you you are actively still looking at you know deals, whether they're development deals or whether they're stabilized workforce housing deals. Um, so, so talk about the, the tweak in, in how you guys are still moving forward on stuff rather than sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. So the deals that we're still doing, I still do these things the same way. Uh, one of the first calls I make is to our, our, our lender broker and I'll say, okay, here's the deal. Here's what it looks like. Here's what I think it is. Where do you think, where do you think the rate would end up? And he just gives me a rough ballpark. Okay. I think it's going to end up at 5.3 whatever right uh is like is that the worst case he goes yeah it's usually the worst case so i'll underwrite to whatever the worst case he believes it's going to end up at you know? yeah. so even though right now i mean that what we're talking the other day you, you're, you guys are finding debt at four six you know uh but he'll he might quote me five three i'll underwrite at five three mm -hmm. i don't I, you know, and, and you know, what amortization, what kind of, what, what type of debt is it? Is it bridge? Is it, is it, you know, okay, well, if it's bridge, uh, how is there an IO period? How long is the IO? It's like uh, early, uh, most, what some people will do is they'll, they'll get very, very aggressive on their rate. They'll get very aggressive on their AM. They'll get very aggressive on the IO. It's like, we still do things the same way we've done them. We're never aggressive in any of that stuff, right? I'm just not, I'm always super conservative with that. So that part's not changed, right? What matters nowadays is like the, the cost per unit, um, the rents. I mean, it's, it's, when it comes to value add stuff, nothing has really changed all that much in terms of how we're doing it. You know, it's, uh, but it, it is more difficult to find deals that work. That's the hard part, you know, because many of the sellers are still expecting the valuations, the air quote valuation to be what it was 18 uh, months ago, 18 months ago. And it's like, mm -hmm. dude, it's not, it's not, this, we're not in the same market anymore. It's just not the same market. It's shifting. You know? It is shifting. It's shifted. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. and this is, I'm seeing this not only on, on the multifamily side, we're seeing this on the, uh, on the net lease business too. We have a net lease business and we, we acquire single tenant net lease assets. And we've seen, like we've seen the, some of these assets jump up by two points, you know, uh, in terms of the cap rate. Now that's where cap rate matters. It's a whole different set, set so of whole different that, cases. And, and that, and so you said it right there, right? Because I think that, you know, rather than use the word shifting, right? I think that we've almost, we're tapering off in yeah. some way because 
know, I think that we were so undervalued for such a long time here that, you know, we caught up and we just caught up fast, right? Mm -hmm. fast. Probably where this market should have been valued, um, especially with when you bring in more of a diverse uh, investor pool, where it's not just your local Cleveland or local Northeast Ohio owner that's owning here, right? So when you, when you do bring in the East Coast, some, so, you know, obviously the, the people from Texas, right? Kenny, right? The Kennys of the world. And, and, you, and you have new blood coming into the market. You know, I don't think that it was like, oh man, things were overpriced two, two years ago. It was like, hey, the correction was, we just came, we, we caught up. And oh, I no. think, mm -hmm. you know, where we're at now is almost just a little bit of a taper where it's like, hey, this is not going to be the market where you're going to experience all, you know, this appreciation at all times, right? Because this is the, the bulletproof cash flow market, right? So you know, you're always going to have that cash flow. You're going to have the ebbs and flows, in my opinion, where, you know, you can experience um, set some appreciation because of the outside, you know, organic market, you know, environmental stuff that, you know, you don't necessarily have control of. But in terms of cash flow and stability, I think that, you know, we are in a place where we're still seeing, you know, uh, a rent growth, right? Projected rent growth. We're still seeing record breaking rent growth, right? Um, I think there are, are so many opportunities that we come up with uh, that we see where, you know, rents are still so, so far, you know, just, it's just so far, you know, under market and, uh, and tired, right? So I think there's a ton of opportunity that's left here. Um, but yeah, to your point, I think that there has been a little bit of a taper in terms of, you know, the expectation of, hey, you know, two years ago, my, my property jumped in value. So, you know, my expectations are that it's still happening that in that same, mm -hmm. uh, in that same trend where it, it you know, that may have slowed down. And there's a like, taper oh, there. You know, yeah. 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 Awesome. But yeah, I agree. I think, I think yeah, yeah. At one time we had we had the cash flow and the appreciation, right? The past five years, it's kind of been side by side, which is correct. At least in my experience, something new here. Well, well, um, it, it, it depends on on how you how, how you quantify appreciation because appreciation here in the Midwest is, in my opinion, normal, right? It's it's a normal air quote normal appreciation, meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, Cleveland has, and, and the Cincinnati, many of the, like the, these types of markets, uh, it, it isn't like they're going to have the mass influx of, of people coming in like they would, like what's, what's, what's going down uh, in, in, um, in Miami, for instance, or Florida, right? Like uh, all this migration taking place from those blue states going to the, to going to the red states to avoid the, the madness of what's happening there. It's, um, now here, yes, there, there's, there, there's certainly a lot of jobs moving in here. A lot of jobs moving in here. We're going to have 20,000 new jobs right next door to this, this Rockefeller building I'm in currently. And um, very, very exciting. Is, is this going to be like Miami? It's, it's not. You know, in Miami, they're having these jumps where like, it's 150,000 for this asset this year. In 12 months, that same asset might be 225. And the rents are pretty much the same. The rents have been flat or very minimal increase. Uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand mm -hmm. that. Well, I, that's why I, you're I, in Cleveland. That's why I'm in Cleveland. But mm -hmm. but but it, but it's also that um, the, the appreciation we have here is it's more like it's almost like is, there is appreciation because of the demand. Just as Anthony pointed out, a lot of money coming in from out from out of out of state now because now they've realized. There's value here. There are jobs coming here. There have been jobs coming here, right? I kind of like, I knew the secret. I figured it out early on. And yes. I got in, I started trying to buy my hand, buy anything I could. And uh, I figured it out. Uh, other, other people have figured it out now too. And, um, you know, I, I think there's still value here. Uh, but, you know, it, the, the deals are tight, I will admit, uh, like they are everywhere else. You know, sure. it, it's, it's just got to make the right decision. Uh, to, to pick up the right assets, you know, and um, that's the hard part, you know, that's the hard part, like any, like any other market. But the, the thing though is, is that the, the important thing to stress is that we don't do, what I don't do is these wild uh, appreciation type plays. I just don't do those types of deals. I, you know, I'm not the guy for that because uh, when, the, when the recession hits, like I said earlier, and there will be a recession, I've been through a bunch of them already, the it's going to hurt it's going to be painful and you know 
it's uh, people don't remember the pain that went through last time. It's going to suck this next time, right? And the last thing I want to do is be responsible for a hundred million dollar asset and the value of the asset basically it's cut in half and then you're handing it back over to the bank. You know, I don't want to be one of those guys. I'm not going to be one of those guys. I won't do it. I just, I'm just yeah. not going to participate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there are guys that do that stuff. I mean, we're looking at buying an asset by one of these guys right now. You know, he, he overpaid for it. And uh, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get a deal on it. You know, sorry about your luck. <laughs> and that's, we'll be there to pick it up, you know, so. Well, August, you know, as you and I talk about a lot, and as Peter and I were introducing Tony to, uh, you being the Rockefeller man, is that, you know, hey, as times are starting to get where there's a bit of a, you know, su supply demand imbalance here in, in Northeast Ohio in terms of uh, inventory, um, you and you and Kenny, your partner, you guys started looking into the development side of things and obviously the conversion of the Rockefeller. And so uh, talk about uh, and maybe you can uh, go into a little bit of detail for Tony, uh, you being the Rockefeller man. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah very is. cool. It is. It is. No, it's uh, I still, uh, you know, I, I still uh, uh, it's still so much surreal. You know, even it's been years now we've had this asset and it's still, it's still wild, man. It really is uh, very thankful. Uh, but we, we were acquiring a lot of these assets and, uh, you know, early on a couple of years ago, we still do, we still do today on occasion, whenever they present themselves. And um, we started moving into development or in this case, in the case of the Rockefeller building, redevelopment. So this building uh, was built in 1905 uh it's a 17 story building right here in downtown cleveland uh and at the time that we acquired it it was uh, we already knew that sherman williams was going to be building their world headquarters literally right next door like over the street and then there's going to be their headquarters we kind of already we knew that that was coming it hadn't been formally announced but we knew it was coming so uh, we made a play to acquire this asset and put up uh, multifamily here so we're converting this asset to 400 and some 400 plus apartment complex, apartment units, uh, two floors of office, and the rest of it's going to be uh, like amenity space and restaurants and, and things like that. So very, very exciting, very exciting. And uh, this is just the one asset. We're also doing ground up developments as well. Uh, we actually have an ongoing project uh, currently right by the hospital. Uh, the hospital uh, is going to be uh, Cleveland Clinic. It's going to be hiring 20,000 people over the next 10 years, and we're yeah. a block away. You know, so we're doing that one. We're doing we 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 have another we just launched another project, um, a fund uh, to raise capital for that one, and we're going to be doing uh, two more in that area, like all around there, to satisfy that demand for housing that these people are going they're going to need, right? They're going to need a place to live. So, um, and then we also have other redevelopment type of plays too. So, um, like I like I alluded to before, we have our our stabilized asset acquisition business, we have our development business, we have our net lease business. And these are the three things that we're focused on currently. Um, what's coming up is we're getting, believe it or not, we're, we're actually looking at acquiring single families as well. We're back at that again, um, which I never thought I'd ever do. But I, I, I honestly believe that when, when the market does turn, the people that are going to that will want a place to live to actually buy the banks are not going to back them up and we will mm. you know i'll back them up you know so uh right now we're just in acquisition mode and then we also have another line that we haven't you know we i know we've been talking about doing hotels and other hospitality type of uh, type of assets as well so we have that, that's still that the hospitality business is still fairly new for us but the other things are all ongoing right now you know we have a fund that goes and acquires single tenant at least assets. We're very, very excited about that. And, um, and that is really a case of uh, not only diversifying what we're currently doing, uh, but also offering our investors a way to get good, solid, consistent monthly returns, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like very, very predictable, very predictable, right? Uh, so it's, it's a very different asset than multifamily or de or development, you know, each one, each, each one of the, each one of these three assets, uh, I guess, projects, if you will, or deals have very different return profiles, right? 
and it's all they're all risk adjusted returns right and if you're looking for a nice steady coupon very predictable and a third of every month you're going to get a, you're going to get a money wired or ach to your account net lease is where you should be it's mm. perfect it's great you know can't really promise that with with development can't really promise that with with um with value add either you know so it's um it's, it's yeah risk adjusted returns right so yeah those are the three things that we're doing right now and um it, a lot of it is it is indeed a function of you know what's going on in, in the value add uh, asset acquisition model that's that's currently taken hold you know it's it's, it's very very competitive uh and it's also very it's tough to find deals these days you know so you kind of have to diversify you have to you know i think you're super smart to look at all things residential housing you mentioned this getting back into single family portfolios which you know i'm sure as most listeners know is, is hot right now um from an investment standpoint um I know you're not jumping into things simply because they're hot. You see a need for housing. I mean, we're 4 million homes short. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, becoming a renter, we're becoming a renter nation, Peter. That's what mm -hmm. it is. We're, we're, yeah. we're becoming a renter nation. And yep. again, nothing wrong with that, you know, but um, single family also has a different risk tolerance as well, which, I mean, you have to be prepared to handle that because if you grow that deal too quickly and you have, uh, you know, have a hundred of these things. And if they're all, if they're all the same type of assets, they're all like, let's call them C-class type of assets. And you encounter the same issues that you had with this, with this COVID thing that happened sure. a couple of years ago. You're as an owner of these assets, you're going to be exposed. You're mm. going to be exposed, right? Because you're going to have a lot of tenants decide they're not going to pay now. Uh, you're going to have all that to deal with. So, and, and this is not multifamily. It's a little different. These are these different types of different type of debt structure here. You know, so um, you, you have to be set up appropriately to to acquire uh, the right single families in good strong areas that people want to live at. You know, over the long term. And that's it's not just buying crappy houses. It's not just uh, uh, just for the sake of buying a house. It doesn't work that way. They have to be good, good houses and, and good neighborhoods, and, and you're actually finding a value. That's very, very, very important. Like, like everything else, the, the value, the value has to be there. If it's not there, we don't buy it. You know that, and, and, and for that business, we're using our own capital for that. Like, we're not using investor money for that. You know, so mm -hmm. the discipline around how we acquire assets is, is still the same. It's the same discipline because um, we apply that same discipline with everything that we do. Uh, but it's. Um, but it comes, it, it becomes even more critical because of the exposure on the single family stuff. Because mm -hmm. now it's not like one roof, like there is on this building here, we have one roof, sure. right? Now we yeah, have 100, 100, 100 roofs. Mm -hmm. It gets to be very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they all mm -hmm. go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Augustino, if, uh, if we have a listener that would like to get in contact with you, would be interested in, hey, you know, I, you know, I may not want to be the, the guy, right? But uh, but this sounds interesting, and I'd like to find out more. How do they reach out to you? Where can they go to learn more about you know some of the different invest investments that you guys have to offer or anything like that? Sure, uh, bulletproofcashflow.com is the best way. Uh, just come up, just come up to the website, you can reach out to us there, uh, fill out the form. You know, we'll get an email. Uh, also, you know your usual suspects in social media. Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all, all those were, were all over the place there as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I would, and, I, and I'm glad you said it that way too, Anthony, because, um, you know, this game, it's a tough game and it's, it's becoming a lot harder. It's becoming a lot harder. And uh, uh, you, you should partner up with someone, right? And you should um, get into bigger deals, in my opinion. You should go after bigger deals, and and, and in that end, it doesn't. And I'll tell you the same thing I told one, one, a gentleman the other day. I said, you know what? You could have a hundred million dollars in cash right now in your bank account. You can't get a deal. You cannot buy that deal. You cannot buy any deal. He's like, why is that? I said, because you don't have the relationships with the brokers. You can't. You have the relationships with the lenders, and you have nobody to run it. Right. So it doesn't matter how much money you have. If you don't have or you don't have the experience either. So if you don't have these things, these basic things, basic air quotes, 
um, the, the ability to get a deal is very, very hard, you know? So why not partner with an expert that does it every single day? You know, it makes total sense, right? And you get to skip all the headaches. You get to skip all of the, the problems that come along with, with, uh, with, with doing an asset, right? Sure, the growing pains. Yeah. Oh yeah, all of yeah. it, you know? And, and it's like, and there's nothing wrong with it. As, as, as we, we have partners that come into our deals all the time, and they get to enjoy all the upside and limit the downside, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, I love it, it. it. It works out great for them, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. bulletproofcashflow.com is the best way. Just, you know, go there, check us out. And uh, of course, check out the podcast too. It's another way to, you know, to, uh, to absorb some of the stuff that we're doing too. So there you go. Awesome. Awesome. Great conversation, Augustino. Anthony, Tony, thanks guys. Yeah, I appreciate um, you guys. Thanks guys. Great content. Thanks, listeners, for joining us. Please subscribe to the Rust Belt Department podcast. Looking forward to the next episode. Augustino Pintus, thanks once again.